Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Truth be told, in my 20-some-odd years of preaching the Word of God, I have never in my life preached on this text. Read it, looked at it, and rolled on by. And as we were preparing the sermon this week, because it takes about a week to prepare a sermon, and I'm reading it, and there's a little voice in my head going, just go to, just, just go to chapter 7, just roll on, don't worry about it. And I thought, no, we need to deal with this because these principles touch every one of our lives. And as we work through this, allow the Holy Spirit in you to show you how and what you need to change. This is not a deep, deep theory, uh, uh, series on this. Actually, this is something that can be really drawn out in a Sunday school class. <laughs> and guess what? Sunday school is coming September 17th, by the way. It'll be starting at 9.30. It'll go till 10.15, and then service will be moved till 10, to 10.30. So we're going to have refreshments before morning service. Okay? So let me say that again. Starting September 17th, we're going to have Sunday school, adult Sunday school, and children. And as we grow, we will create other groups, like a, like a young a moms and dads class, uh, something like that. We're going to create what the Lord brings to help everyone in the congregation grow. But starting September 17th, we will have Sunday school. Sunday school will start at 9.30. Right now, we have a couple of adult classes on tap, and we have, we'll be having children uh, Sunday school. Sunday school will go till 10.15. And then we will have refreshments and snacks outside from 10.15 to 10.30. Service will start at 10.30, and after service, we go home. Okay? So that's what the leadership came up with, um, and that's what's going to be happening. So I am sure that between myself and the elders, and uh, we'll be trying to draw out some of these things. Okay? By the way, you can help us. There is a... Um, suggestion box on the wall in the lobby and it has some cards on it and if you would like us to cover something in Sunday school if I'm preaching something and you have a question about it and you want me to contact you or we can call or whatever there's your opportunity to put it in the suggestion box okay if there are particular items that you want to talk about in the Bible that you don't hear a lot of speaking on Put it in the suggestion box, okay? Because we would love, first off, to answer that question biblically. Secondly, if you have that question, so do many others. And that's how you create really great Sunday school classes, because you're literally studying what people want to know about. How cool is that? So let's jump back into our text. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, as we open up these, this text this morning, I ask you, Lord God, that you just help us all, Lord. Help us with these principles, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's take the first uh, verses. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 31. Verses 27 to 31. 
But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. These five verses spells out five new governing principles, governing principles for human relationships, okay? For Christian relationships. These are five principles that Jesus lays out here. In other words, these principles are for Christian behavior. Christian's behavior. New governing principle number one, love your enemies. Boom, right off the bat. Wow. When you first read that, I know as I was reading it a couple, I don't, can't even tell you how many times I read it. What started happening in my brain, and maybe I'm just different from you, but I started lining up the people that hate me, my enemies. I started lining them up in my head. And so as I'm reading through this, I'm like, oh, man. Man, God, you, you, you want me to pray for you? You do want me to pray for them? Really, Lord? Really? Do you know what he did to us and my family? Do you know? Really, Lord? And like me, a lot of these people are in our family. <laughs> right? You're laughing because you know it's true. We went to a huge family function last night, and there were several of them. It was like, oh, and I have already prepared the sermon. <laughs> I'm just being real. I didn't change anything. <laughs> However, how I approached them changed. How I approached them changed. Okay? And that's what this is about. You know, when we learn from the Word of God and, and He teaches us different principles He wants us to apply, our job is to start the process. And as you learn more this morning, it is a process. You're not all of a sudden going to stop hating your enemies. It's not going to happen. You don't flip a switch. No more enemies. They're gone. No, 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 no. It's a process. It's a growth process. Believers are to love all men, even our enemies. Christians are to respect and honor all men. To respect and honor all men. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 says this. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. Okay, when we see that in this scripture, honor the king, that means the government to us. Okay? That means the government to us. Scripture tells us that God puts the government in place. So we are to, we are to be governed by the rules and the laws of our government. It is not Christ-like to go against the government if the government is do doing the right thing and it's righteousness. The Bible tells us that we need to stand up when things are wrong. If the government is leading in a wrong way, they better hear your voice. But we don't collectively hate the government when Scripture tells us that he put the government in place. Okay? Show proper respect. Show proper respect. Proper respect. Many of us have been disrespected to our face. And we have to show proper respect. I remember when um, I used to work for a company that doesn't exist anymore. Bradley's. Remember them? Well, I was one of the operations managers for Bradley's. And it was a very interesting job. Very interesting job. Because 
I was the operations manager for a store in Dorchester, in the black community. And it was very challenging because they realized that I didn't speak the language of the hood, <laughs> as it were. It's a real thing, guys, okay? Because I have been called an Oreo more times than I can remember. Black on the outside, white on the inside. And so I'm running this store, and I'm at, remember the back of the days we had Lairway? Well, Lairway was a big thing. So I'm back there, and the staff is trying to work with these people, and there's a guy completely irate. Okay? So I get called to the Lairway, and I come up and I say, hi, sir, what's the problem? And he goes off. He starts swearing at me, calling me every name in the book. Meanwhile, there's 15 people in line, and there's three people behind the counter who work for us. Now, the thing that's really cool about being a black man is we don't turn red. <laughs> I say that, but I mean that. Okay? So he's yelling and screaming, and he's going off, and people in line are going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> and the temperature is rising. And I very politely looked at him, I put my hands behind my back, and I said, sir, the fact that you're yelling and screaming doesn't change the fact that what you're talking about is wrong. It doesn't change the fact that you're wrong, sir. Now, if you want me to help you and see what we can do, I can do that. But you will not stand here and yell at me like I'm your child. And he looked at me, and I said, so what is the problem in a civil voice, please? And that calmed everyone down in line. The employees were like, I'm calling him every time I have one of these problems. <laughs> but that was a learned thing that I learned. I can tell you out of college, learning how to be a manager, I was in his face. But experience teaches us a lot, doesn't it? So as we go through these principles, many of you have been already doing them. Here's the other thing. Sometimes it doesn't feel right when you do it because you want to give them a left jab. Right? You want to just knock them out. Galatians 6, verses 9 and 10. Let us not become weary of doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity... Let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. The family of believers. Listen, when Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, if you are not a Christian this morning, and you're sitting there saying, well, what does he mean by the family of believers? What Scripture is telling you is that the family of believers are those who has asked Jesus Christ to forgive them of their sins. They know that they're a sinner. They've asked Jesus to forgive them of their sins. And the Bible is very clear because we know the Bible. It's a heart thing. Jesus knows when you're sorry. A lot of people go through the motions and say that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian and their behavior doesn't change. Well, they were just going through the motion by talking. But when you say with your heart, when you say with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins and you ask him for forgiveness, you will be saved. That is what makes you part of the family of believers because you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The old has gone, the new has come. So no matter what family you belong to, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what family, what culture, what color, what nation. All of us who have Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior belong to the family of God. That's the way that it is. And so Scripture wants us to make sure that we, as fellow Christians, treat each other correctly. That's what this text is talking about in Galatians and 1 Peter. The family of believers. The Christian must see all men. This is something really big, and especially because we're talking about enemies. The Christian must see all men and women, even our enemies, as a soul to reach for Christ. Think about that. 
All the people, when I said love your enemies, all y'all conjured up all the people who hate you and all the people you hate. And now I'm saying to you that they have an opportunity to be reached for Christ. And maybe that opportunity is for you, your enemy, to invite the church or to lower the temperature and get to the bottom of the issues. Because we have to start seeing every single soul as a soul that was created by God in the image of God. Every single human being was created by God and made in his image. So that's going to change our whole attitude about what we feel about what's happening in our country, about fit folks trying to flee a land that is corrupt and crazy, and how we view them. Now, don't get me wrong. Do not get this twisted. I believe that everyone that wants to come here should be allowed to come here, but there should be a process to make sure that things lined up. Remember, I just talked about our government, right? So there's a right way to do things. There's a right way to do things. Everyone here is staring at me. Unless you are an American Indian, your family, your relatives came from someplace else. I am not talking to any naturalized American person right now. In the true sense. Unless you were American Indian sitting here. All of us have come from different parts of the world. Many of your grandparents and aunts and uncles and great-grandparents came to this country seeking what? Seeking a better life. Seeking a better life. And all of those cultures had a hard time in the beginning. All of the cultures were segregated. There's one, and I want you to think about this, I can't really go on, but I'm going to say this to you, okay, because it's fact. Every nationality in our country came to this country seeking a better life. They either went through, they either went through New York or they got here. African Americans came as cargo, okay? We were not fleeing Africa seeking a better life, our ancestors. We came as cargo. And so when I explained that whole process to a group of people, I had the opportunity to a couple of years ago, one of my very good friends, Pastor Nelson, he is the uh, lead pastor of the Chinese Christian Church in Providence. And he asked me if I would speak to his people because they were coming from China and they didn't understand this racism against black people. They didn't get it. And so he asked me to come and speak to them about the plight. And you should have heard the questions. So that's a whole different topic and, and everything else. But understand, every one of your nationalities, your background, your well, whoever you are, French, Italian, Greek, Polish, whatever, you came, your families came here seeking a better life. And so when we turn on the TV and we see the problems at our border and they are real and they are problems, our approach should be one, to pray, two, for us to come up with a better system to allow them to come here so that we can sift through the troublemakers. Yeah, there are people in that group that want to cause harm. Absolutely. And if we can come up with a plan to keep them away, we will. But we can't group everyone in one little box and say, okay, everyone trying to get in, they're bad. No, that's a lie. I told you, these verses are dealing with what we're dealing with. Okay? The Christian must see all men, even their enemies, as a soul to be reached for Christ. We do. That's, we need to do that. Believe me, I understand how hard this is. Loving your enemies is totally against human nature. It is. It's totally against human nature. 
New governing principle number two. Do good to those who hate you. Do good to those who hate you. Remember, most of the people hearing these words from Jesus were enslaved people, conquered by the Romans and hated by them. So Jesus is talking to a people who really aren't free. And the government in charge of them hates them. And he's telling them this. Think on that for a second. Hmm. Wow. Romans 12, chapter 20 says that. Romans chapter 12, verse 20 says this. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And as I started to really untie this, do you realize that this principle is throughout all of Scripture? Sometimes when we read the words of Jesus, we think, oh, that's New Testament. Those, these, this principle is from the Old Testament. If you don't believe me, turn to Exodus chapter 23. Turn to Exodus chapter 23 and mark this. Exodus chapter 23, verse 5. If you see the donkey of someone who hates you fallen down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure you help him with it. Do you see the thread of that principle? Read that again. Exodus chapter 23, verse 5. Moses' words. If you see a donkey of someone who hates you fallen under its load, do not leave it there, but share, but be sure you help him with it. Come alongside and help him. Now, who was Moses talking to? The Israelites. At that time, we can make the transfer that it was the body of believers. It was the body of believers. Doing good to those who actually hate you goes beyond words. So when we say do good to those who hate you, okay, and you say, well, how, how, how? Here's the how. The Christian is actually to do a physical thing for their enemy. To do a physical thing for their enemy. If somebody hates you and they are in need of something and you know that they need something, then you should just get what they need if you have the means. And don't sit there and wait for a thank you. Don't sit there and wait for, oh, you're so wonderful. You give it to them and you walk away. Because remember, these principles are for our behavior not for our personal gratification from the world. Okay? It's for our behavior. It grows us. Governing, new governing principle number three. Bless those who curse you. Oh. Really, God? Really? Let me get this straight, Jesus. When someone swears and curses at me, you want me to softly, to speak softly and be kind. Yes. The world doesn't. But we must. It's going to take some self-control. Many of you have jobs that the temperature rises real quick. Many of you are students in school, and there are groups of students that live on raising the temperature because they love chaos, because their chaos puts them in control. Many college campuses are like that. High school, you got all these things going on. You got everything going on in the world today that is absolutely crazy. If you were to take your grandparent, 
And I know I'm talking to a multi-generational group. So no matter who you are, if you had a, grand, if you had a grandparent, if you were to take your grandparent and to explain to them what's going on today, what would be the look on their face? We have states that are trying to make it legal that a child under 18 can go have a sex change without their parents knowing about it because they feel like they want to change. We have the truth, the truth being whitewashed because of the ability of the internet to put out there anything that anybody wants, if you're not looking to find the truth, you will find a bunch of mess that never even happened, that it's on the news as truth. We have politicians telling straight up lies and getting elected. And then once in office go, well, I lied. Did you go to college? You said you work for this company. You no. Really? And here's the part that drives me crazy because we have taken the word truth and we have allowed it to be destroyed. We've allowed it to be destroyed because we, as God's children, have not stood up for righteousness. So everybody in their brother knows that this one particular uh, p politician is a stone cold habitual liar. Everyone knows it. It's been proven. And you have people lining up about, uh, behind him saying, well, we're for him until you prove it. We're for him until. Really? Really? We have taken the truth we have taken the principle of truth and we have slowly eroded it in our country. And guys, Christians have joined the bandwagon. We have lined up. We have politicized sin. I'm sorry, this is not a sermon on this, but I just... Guys, if you are the family of God, and you've been called to righteousness, righteousness means everywhere. It doesn't just mean on Sunday morning. We are called to walk in righteousness in a crooked and dark world. If you have the opportunity, when you're in a group of, in, at work and people are talking and everything else, and you have an, you have an ability to say, you know, I disagree with that, because the truth of the matter is this, this, and this. That is standing up for righteousness. A lot of times we don't because we don't want to hear the, we don't want, we want to be part of the team. We want to be part of everything. Let me tell you something. I cannot compromise who I am. And when you are, are, are afraid to stand up for truth and righteousness, you are literally compromising who you are. Because by staying silent means you're with them. You can say I disagree very respectfully, very openly, and continue working. We don't have to get down in the dirt with them. We don't have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. Romans 12, verse 14 says this, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. There we go again. 1 Peter 9, verses, uh, 1, Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Because this you were called so, for this, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So when someone is cursing at me, when someone is really uh, having a front in my face, and I sit there and I, we call it taking it, we have to learn when we're in this world. I'm going to give you an illustration. I think I've told you this before that I'm a mama's boy. 
and my mother taught me how to sew, and I used to cut out the patterns and, and pin them on the, the material and all that stuff. And something fascinated me about what my mother was doing. She had this tomato. It was a cushion tomato, right? And all the pins were stuck in this tomato. Guys, that is what, what a lot of Christians are like. They take what people say to them and they put it in the tomato and let it stay there. Instead of understanding whose we are, we need to have the attitude, you ever see a duck in the water when it's raining? And the water rolls down the duck's back and back into the water. That's what we need to build in our Christendom, in who we are in Christ. Do not allow the world to insult you, because they're going to insult you, but your behavior is what dictates how you feel about it. If you allow it to stick in you, like the tomato that my mother used for the, you know, the, the cushion, the needles, then that means that you're allowing it, and you know what happens? Because every time we got done working, my mother took that cushion and put it away. So that cushion, that insult, that thing that the world has given you, you're now putting it inside of your person. So that is slowly eating away at you eternally. When we need to turn it around. You see, Scripture turns that mess around. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he saved you, he wants to build in you a new person. And he builds us from the inside out. So if you still got all those pins inside of you and, and bothering you, then one by one you have got to give them to the Lord. And by the renewing of your mind is when you're in his word. And slowly those pins will disappear and you'll start walking like a duck. Because it'll roll off you. Proverbs 15, 1 says this, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So when someone is yelling and cursing at you, and you're sitting there, instead of you taking it, you just give back a nice word. I'm sorry you feel that way. I believe you're wrong. We both have an opinion. Thank, thank you for sharing yours and walk away. Don't let it stick in. New governing principle number four. Pray for those who mistreat you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Some of us may be going through the situation where people trying to shame us with their words or lies because they can't get their way. Nah, nah, I, I can't get my way, so I'm going to say this about them. I'm going to spread this lie or that lie, this mistruth or that mistruth. Happens all the time. Happens all the time. Nevertheless, Christians are to pray for them. Now, this principle is huge. This principle of praying for those who mistreat us, who hate us, is huge. I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a personal story. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what, what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes. So when Jesus was getting ready to be crucified, Jesus is asking and praying that the Father, they don't forget to forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. You have the same type of scene in Acts. Remember Stephen, one of the first deacons? Okay. In Acts chapter 7, verse 59 to 60, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell to his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he, had, when he had said this, he fell asleep. 
Don't hold their sin against them. So two examples in the Bible of men getting ready to die and praying for those who are doing the killing. Now that's dramatic in the scripture. But I want to share something with you that was hate, but it was perceived. So Michelle and I, at this time, we had Adrian, Nina, and Logan, and Taylor was not born yet. And we were living in, no, Taylor was born. Taylor was running around as a toddler. We were living in Maryland, Westminster, Maryland. We had just built a 3,000 square foot home. I was working for a company, and it was, everything was going great. Our next door neighbors, they moved in before us. Our kids were playing on the street together all the time. No big deal. One day I came home from work early, and my neighbor had his garage door up. And on the back of his wall was the biggest Confederate flag I've ever seen in my life. And they were our next door neighbor, so they were, their house was 20 feet from our house, maybe 30 feet. And it was a big old Confederate flag hanging up in his, in his garage, the back of the garage. And so I called Adrian and Nina and Logan over and I said, get in the house. And I brought him in the house and I explained to them what that flag meant to us as African Americans in this country. And I said, I don't want you playing with them. Of course, they were like, we don't understand, Daddy, you know, and all this. I said, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll understand. So Michelle says, honey, well, did you talk to him? I said, the flag already talked to me. Guys, when your wife tells you to do something, when your wife makes a suggestion in a loving, sensi sensible way, y'all better do it. Because I was ready to just put up a fence I was ready, you, you know, we're done here. And so when Jeff, is his name, came home, I walked over and he goes, um, his wife's name is Kim, and he said, well, Kim told me that the kids were pulled in and couldn't come out and play with the kids. And he says, can I ask you why? I says, yeah, Jeff. I says, pull up your garage door. I pull up his garage door. And I said, you see that flag? He said, yeah, that's what I grew up with. And I explained to him what that flag meant to African Americans. He had no idea. He generally, really had no idea how insulting that was to African American people. He took the flag down, almost in tears, apologizing. Now let me fast forward. About six months later, his wife got pregnant and had a little baby, and the baby was born with a heart defect. We took their kid while they spent days and days in the hospital, and we openly prayed with them about their child. Okay? Jeff and Kim are two of the closest people to us that I can mention. They came up for our children's graduation. We went down for their children's graduation. I have shared the gospel with this family more times than you can imagine, because you all know me. Their youngest son, the one that had the heart problem, is a Christian. So we experienced that. And we also experienced that when people identify with something hateful, doesn't mean that they're hateful. It means that that's how they were raised. And after explaining it to him, I mean, this is the guy that texts me every time his Orioles beat my Red Sox. Every single time. When we go to Baltimore, we stay at their house. When they come here, they stay at our house. Hate is a learned behavior, people. It's a learned behavior. And we as Christians need to rid it from who we are. Hate is a learned behavior. Now, rest of the story, Jeff and I, I mean, Jeff and um, 
and Kim sold their house last year in, uh, in Westminster, Maryland and moved to Florida. And they moved 10 minutes from where the Red Sox do spring training. <laughs> so guess what I was getting movies of, of them sitting in the stands playing the Orioles during preseason. Larry, Michelle, when you're coming down, they're the closest, some of the closest friends we have. And we're praying that they come into the kingdom because we're the first ones they call when stuff goes wrong. We pray for them over the phone. It's just fabulous. Here's the principle I want you to identify, okay? If you don't, if you don't remember anything else, about the sermon this morning, I want you to remember this principle. Praying for the persecutor, the persecutor, the person who persecutes you, will greatly benefit the Christian. When we pray for those who hate us, when we pray for those who mistreat us, it's the greatest thing that you can do as a Christian. Let me explain. It's the part of the Lord's process to keep the Christian from becoming bitter, hostile, and reactionary. Think about that. If you pray for those who hate you, if you pray for your enemies, if you pray for those who mistreat you, the Lord uses your prayer as a process for you so that you will not be bitter, you will not be, have hostility against them, and you won't be reactionary. Whoa. Whoa. Pray for them. Pray for them. And as you do that from the heart, remember, everything is a heart thing. As you do that from the heart, the Lord does what? He is growing you internally. You will lose that bitterness. You will not be reactionary towards that person. It's huge. That's a huge principle. New governing principle number five, offer the other cheek. In other words, Jesus is saying, don't retaliate. Now, a lot of Christians get this twisted. And John MacArthur straightens it out. Okay? John MacArthur straightens it out. This is a direct quote from John MacArthur. The point of clarification, this principle relates to a matter of personal retaliation, not criminal offenses or acts of military aggression. Okay? Let me say that one more time. Turning the other cheek does not mean when things are going crazy because you're being sinned against, like... The, he says, this is a point of clarification. This principle relates to a matter of personal retaliation, not criminal offenses. Someone's attacking you, and you turn around and say, well, you know, hit this side, because I don't want to go home with just a, one black eye. Hit the other eye. That is not what he's saying here. This principle is not for crimes against uh, people. And it's also not for the military. I just I have to put that out there. Because as I was studying it, and John MacArthur brought it out, many Christians get this thing warped. So let me give you John MacArthur's quote one more time. A point of clarification. This principle relates to a matter of personal retaliation, not criminal offenses or acts of military aggression. A great principal illustration of this is the scene. Now, we're talking about turning the other cheek, okay? A great biblical, in biblical instruction of this is the scene in chapter 18, starting in verse 19, when Jesus was questioned by the high priest. The temperature rises during the conversation, not with Jesus, but the temple officials. Here's the physical assault on Jesus and his 
response. This is John chapter 18, verses 20 to 23. John 18, verses 20 to 23. This is Jesus, Jesus. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in the synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. Standing on his word. Then when Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Well, first off, he struck, he struck the Son of God. Wrap your arms around that for a moment. You had the audacity to strike the Son of Man. <clears throat> wow. Wow. Is this the way, and so it says, when Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? And instead of Jesus, you know, give him a right cross, instead of him calling down angels, which he could have done, think of how we would have reacted with that. Someone flat out slaps you in public, and you have the power to rain down on them. I know Larry would have. I ain't lying. Angels, Gabriel, do your thing. But here you have Jesus, and this is what he says. If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testifies as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Why did you strike me? We need to move on. Luke chapter 6, verse 32 to 34. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lead, if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. Loving those who love you, doing good to those who are good to you, and lending to those whom you know will pay you back, guys, that is not credit to us as righteousness. It's not. Even the world does that. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 says this. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. We were horrible. Each one of you, if you had an opportunity to tell your testimony before you came to Christ, but in the world's view, you were just a normal guy. Biblically, we were horrible. Horrible. Romans 5, verses 8 and 10 says this, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood... How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, because we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? We were enemies of God, and he saved us. Bottom line, this is the bottom line to this. It takes more than the virtue of goodness, of love and doing good and lending amongst men to become a follower of Christ. The problem with that is the world and many churches think that good works and those things are their ticket to heaven. That is a works-based salvation. And salvation is not works-based. You didn't earn your way to become a Christian. You didn't earn that. That was a free gift that you accepted from the Lord Jesus Christ. And the world has that mixed up. Let me tell you a story from last night. So I'm talking to a young man. And his son plays in, um, in leagues in town and, and stuff. And he's really a good ball player. And this young man is a Christian. Well, 
okay. He goes to church. So he says to me, he says, well, you know, uh, we've been missing a lot of church lately and stuff, and I know, you know, um, I said, well, you know, are there men's Bible studies during the course of the week that you can get to? And, you know, I'm just, you know, very lightly salting, you know, very lightly, you know. And he goes, well, no, you know, we, the schedule's really crazy and everything else. And I said, okay. He says, but you know what? I said, what? He goes, I give my tithe. And without going into a real long thing, because I felt the blood coming up, and I remember I was, at a, I was at a family party, and everyone is dressed up, and, and people are drinking, and, and I just looked at him, and I said, well, that's nice. And I walked away, because I know, I know that I should, that if I had gone into what I wanted to go into, that it wouldn't have been a good thing. We have many people in our families, many people you work with who believe because they do certain things that they're going to heaven. It's a works-based belief. It's a works-based belief, guys. We can't do that. We can't do that. The Lord Jesus Christ has set the mark for glory. And the mark is through his son, Jesus Christ, and covered by his blood. That is the only mark that matters. Okay? Verses 35 and 36. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lead, lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Christians need to keep our eyes on the prize. We need to keep our eyes on the prize. The prize is glory, guys. When all else fails, and you're in the midst of a whole lot of junk, and the world and work and school and all this stuff is all going against you because people want to identify different things. And they, wanna, they want you to flat out lie without saying, please lie for me. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard for me. I've talked to our elders about this. And I've been praying about how to develop a sermon on this subject matter. But I'm just going to give you a, a little taste of what we were discussing. Because these two guys calm me down. Because sometimes I just go off. When you were dealing with a person that was born male but wants to be a female starts the process of becoming a female changes their name and lies to themselves and they look at you and say my name is susan and they got a voice deeper than yours they got an adam's apple the size of a golf ball you know exactly what they're doing and I look at them, and I won't call them by the name that they made up because I believe it forces me to lie. Think about that. Let that set in. That individual has decided to live a lie. And the world is allowing that lie to be legal. Think about that. The world is allowing their lie to be legal because they identify as a female. Or they identify as a male and they were born a female. And so we have laws being changed. Now, now get this. Laws being changed to identify a lie as the truth. Now here's the bottom line, and I gotta go on. Scripture says that we're all gonna stand before the throne. <laughs> That's what I'm telling you to keep your focus on glory. We're all going to stand before the throne. 
And that person who was born male and dies as a trans female, when they stand before the throne, are they going to tell God who they think they are before he cast them to hell? hell? Because what they're saying, in essence, is God made a mistake. Think about that. They're saying that God made a mistake. That God made this person a male, and they want to be a female, so God is wrong. You know, I was talking with my sister on the phone this week. We have a lot of long talks sometimes. And I was talking with her. And I said to Michelle, I said, my sister's name is Michelle. I said, if you're arguing with God, you're wrong. Think about that. I'm going to do battle with you, Lord. Really? Really? But that's how those individuals are going to stand before the throne. Whole nother thing. We need to keep our eyes on the prize. Okay? I'm going to end it here. We need to keep our eyes on the prize. I'm going to give you one verse to keep your eyes on the prize. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. This Bible is telling us we're going to go through mess. No one's getting out of this deal unscathed. We're going to all deal with the world and its mess. We're going to deal with our own personal sin and its mess. Oh, but God, keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on glory. The Bible tells us we're going to go through mess. Don't be surprised. Stand tall and try to, and ask the Lord, how do you deal with it? Here's your walking away thought with Scott and the praise team. Please stay seated. I'm going to give you your walking away thought, and then the praise team will pray us out. Here's your walking away thought. What a challenge this week to study and preach on some of the very things many of us struggle with. Not holding a grudge or snapping back at someone someone threatening you with open and clear disdain. Not snapping back. They're in your face. And God doesn't want us to snap back. Loving Loving your enemies. Wow. It's my prayer that you can walk away with one of these three principles this morning that the Lord showed us. One of these three principles, if you can apply it to your life, It'll change a lot. The Christian must see all men, even our enemies, as a soul to be reached for Christ. They are, guys. They are. Remember that we were all enemies of God before we became a believer. We were all enemies. So we need to see our enemies and those that mistreat us. We must see them as someone to be reached for the gospel. Principle number two. This is the one that I have to tell you that I started to really employ because a new prayer was important, and I always pray, but this, studying it this week, really emphasized the, the other side of what prayer does to you and how it blesses you, okay? Praying for the persecutor will greatly benefit the Christian 
It's part of the Lord's process to keep the Christian from becoming bitter, hostile, and reactionary. When you pray for those who hate you, when you pray for your enemies, when you pray for things that are really, as they used to say, got my goat, and you do that, the Lord will use that prayer to help you and ease that bitterness and that hostility that you have towards whatever you're praying for. And the last principle, Christians need to keep their eyes on the prize. We need to keep our eyes on the prize. Our prize is glory. We need to keep our eyes on the prize no matter how crazy this world gets. Take it away, Scott. 